Talk about obesity. Well, anybody who walks in any ICU or any hospital nowadays can see uh, that there's uh, an increasing problem with obesity in the country. Uh, if you, this is a, the obligatory slides that have to be shown when you have any talk on obesity, showing the increase uh, when most of the country, none of the country had more than 20 percent of the patients, uh, in, of the adults being obese with a BMI over 30, uh, and now most of the country is uh, at uh, is above 20 percent, with some places being above 25 percent. What's even more of a problem for us in the ICU is that the percentage of patients who are in the super obese category, the BMI over 45, 50, is growing up even faster, so that the increase from 1986 to 2000 is about 550 percent in the BMI of greater than 50 category. When we're talking about obesity, there's a number of different classifications that we can use, but most people will consider anybody over uh, a BMI of 35 uh, as obese, and when we're talking about morbid obesity, we're generally talking about BMIs over 40, which is the uh, cutoff for people uh, having uh, bariatric surgery in the United States uh, unless they have comorbid conditions. So what do we do when we're faced with uh, something like this uh, or something like this? Um, what I'm going to talk about today uh, is uh, talk a fair amount about the physiologic changes in morbid obesity, uh, about mechanical ventilation of these patients, talk about some of their pul pulmonary comorbidities, and what uh, I do a little differently when I'm weaning them. I'm not going to talk about airway because I just don't have enough time. However, I've amended the slides uh, to the end of my talk, so in about 30 days you can download them and see them. I gave a talk on this earlier in the meeting. Um, been there, it, thankfully, there's no paucity of data on the, um, the respiratory changes that patients go through in morbid obesity. A lot of them done pre-bariatric surgery or as per, uh, in studies involving bariatric surgery. A lot of them done uh, for, by anesthesiologists in the OR. Uh, but basically we know uh, with fairly good uh, information that patients with morbid obesity have a reduced FRC, an increased uh, risk of atelectasis, an increased work of breathing, uh, decreased compliance, and uh, decreased F, uh, uh, vital capacity, um, total lung capacity, and FRC by up to 30 percent in morbid obesity. And other studies have shown similar results, an increase in abdominal pressure, an increase in AA gradient, and the, uh, an abnormal um, pressure curve. Uh, and there's a lot of um, uh, alterations of the mechanical properties of the respiratory system, which uh, is uh, explained by a reduction of lung volume that's due to the excessive unopposed intra-abdominal pressure. And this intra-abdominal pressure is really part of the problem that you run into in a lot of different ways when we're talking about ventilating these people, as I'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, increased BMI typically leads to a drop in all those uh, lung measures. Uh, also, what is also associated is that if you have a central pattern of fat distribution, so it's not just the fact that you're morbidly obese, but if you have central obesity where you have the thin legs, thin arms, maybe a thin chest, but uh, a lot of central obesity around the belly, that also is going to decrease uh, your FVC and FEV1 as well. Um, all these changes lead to abnormal mechanics when these patients receive mechanical ventilation. So uh, the, the lung volumes are going to be less than expected for their weight. If you've ever seen chest x-rays of these patients in the ICU, you always look and you say, wow, the chest looks small, you know, and it looks like they didn't take the chest x-ray right. But actually it is the lung volumes are actually smaller than you would expect by looking at the chest from the outside. Uh, airway resistance is increased for a number of reasons, uh, and the compliance uh, of the whole um, abdominal system, uh, is the whole, of the whole system is decreased because of the adiposity of the, um, of the, uh, uh, chest wall and abdomen. Uh, airway pressures are higher than expected for the volume and if the, the, the thing, you, the problem we run into most often is that if you uh, give tidal volumes based on actual body weight you're going to get high airway pressures. However, these high airway pressures are not transalveolar pressures. So do, do they really cause the same or carry the same risk for barotrauma as a patient who's got normal compliance or normal amounts of fat? That's an open question. There, I was uh, talking with some of the people from East Carolina University, and they're thinking about putting together a protocol uh, to actually measure intra, uh, uh, transalveolar pressure by, with an esophageal balloon in these patients to try and get to that issue. Because if you don't have a transalveolar pressure gradient, 
then you don't aren't at the same risk for barotrauma and you can safely go up to peak airway pressures of 40 or 45. What that allows you to do is to be able to then avoid the atelectasis. And so it, it, you get caught in a system, you get caught in a, in, a, in a conundrum where if you're trying to ventilate like you would ventilate a normal patient, and I tend to use a, a peak error pressure of 35, a pressure control at 35 is my limit, you will tend to hypoventilate these patients because you just can't generate the same tidal volumes with that pressure. Um, you've got fat accumulation in all these anatomical areas. It interferes with diaphragmatic movement, um, and the chest wall compliance is reduced. Now, the, all the, the effect of all these derangements is to increase the work of breathing for the patient. So this comes into play both when you've got the mechanical work of breathing from the ventilator, but also when you've got the patient trying to wean and do the work of breathing themselves uh, after they've been on the ventilator. So the uh, whole respiratory system uh, has an increase in impedance, an increase in resistance, and an increase in intrinsic PEEP. Uh, to compensate for this, the body has to increase respiratory drive, uh, develop a greater uh, pressure, a di greater diaphragmatic pressure output, and there's an increased reliance on the accessory muscles. These compensatory mechanisms are quickly over, um, uh, overridden in critical illness, and, these, and the, that, this is one of the reasons why these patients fail so quickly when they get um, critically ill. Uh, the uh, abnormal uh, mechanics of the chest wall uh, then lead you to do certain things when, you, when you're setting up the ventilator. What the current consensus is that I've seen written about most often, there's no uh, randomized control trials or any good literature out there, it's just what people do is to take the ideal body weight, set the, the ventilator at the ideal body weight, and then titrate based on blood gases. Um, you can spend a lot of time trying to decide what the way to calculate the ideal body weight is. Uh, in one of the talks I gave earlier in the Congress, I pointed out that the, the the usual calculation that people use for ideal body weight showed up in one paper in 1974 on genomycin dosing and has not been valid validated since, but everybody uses it. So we don't know really what weight to use when you're talking about this, but pick a, pick a number, va ventilate, and then just titrate very frequently with blood gases. Uh, like I said, the uh, difficulty exists in interpreting the airway pressures. One thing that is certain is PEEP is your friend when, ven when ventilating these patients. They need PEEP, they love PEEP, they do better with PEEP. Uh, in this one study from uh, Pelosi, uh, the um, uh, PEEP increased uh, significant improvements in lung compliance, in chest wall compliance, in the pulmonary volume curve, and in oxygenation. Um, it's only effective when it's set high enough, so you know, going from five to seven of PEEP really doesn't do much. I automatically, when I bring a patient to the operating room, I'm doing bariatric surgery, put them on 15 PEEP right away. Um, I, you know, in the, in the ICU, maybe I'll start at 10, but I just, I, I find that, you know, the more PEEP, as long as the, the peak error pressures don't go up too much, uh, they, they just seem to, to avoid getting atelectatic if you set the high PEEP. PEEP is a lot better for them than high, than high tidal volume breathing. There's been a number of studies showing that high tidal, tidal volume breathing does not help in re reducing atelectasis. Um, and if you apply it early, uh, sometimes, you know, there are some people who like to apply it you know, put, put BiPAP on them before they sedate them in the OR because they feel that that prevents the atelectasis and keeps them open. I don't necessarily do that, but some people do that. Um, when you're ventilating these patients, position is a very important, okay? The supine position is bad. The panis sits uh, on the belly. Um, it, it pushes the diaphragm into the chest, and they just can't breathe. Now, what the next pe best thing people do is they put people in the cardiac chair position. That also isn't too good because the panis still tends to sit and push up into the diaphragm. Probably the best position for these patients is the reverse Trendelenburg position, uh, as steep as you can get. The problem with this is gravity takes over, and these patients always end up at the bottom of the, of the bed when you try and put them in reverse T-Berg. So um, it might be the best position for... Um, ventilation, but it's the worst position for trying to take care of them because they're always sliding to the bottom. Um, the, some of the bariatric beds go into a, a full chair position where you can actually change it from a flat bed to a chair that's almost 90 degrees fully bolt upright, and the patient can actually walk out of the bed if they're walking. Um, the problem with this is that this is probably better than anything else that we have, and I try to use it as much as possible, with maybe a little bit of Trendelenburg tilt so that they're sit seated back in a little bit of a reclining position. But when their legs, if they're very, if they're short, you know, and a lot of our bariatric, or a lot of our obese patients are, you know, fairly short females, it seems to be, 
um, then their knees tend to push, then their thighs tend to push the pannus back up into the diaphragm, and you still have the same problem. It's better than the cardiac chair, but not by much. When you try, have the patient who's the most difficult to ventilate, the best position for these patients is the lateral recumbent position. Um, they have to be turned frequently because you're going to end up getting some atelectasis on the dependent lung, but this is the one where the belly gets off the, uh, out of the way of the diaphragm, and they tend to oxygenate the best. If you've got a unilateral pulmonary condition, obviously you've got to watch, you know, you've got to see which side you ventilate on the best and which one you oxygenate on the best. But from a pure pulmonary mechanics standpoint, the lateral recumbent position is probably the best position. Uh, we put them in about three quarters lateral recumbent, uh, more than we would do with a lateral tilt for an um, OB case, but still you want to get that, the, the panis off the, the, uh, the diaphragm. Um, morbid obesity is associated as an independent predictor of uh, prolonged mechanical ventilation, extended weaning periods, longer ICU time, longer hospital length of stay, although some studies have been equivocal on this and said that maybe it isn't as powerful predictor as it was uh, in this study. It's felt to due to the increased work of breathing and the mechanics. Um, morbid obesity patients with similar Apache 2 scores have higher rates of mortality, nursing home admission, and a whole host of in intensive care unit complications, and with longer um, ICU stays. Um, the combination of increased abdominal pressure, the high volumes, the low pH of the gastric contents, the high incidence of diabetes, uh, the gastroparesis that it comes along with it, uh, these patients are at higher risk for gastric aspiration, and so um, if, you, uh, if, if you are equivocal about uh, uh, gastric uh, prophylaxis, these might be patients who might benefit from it uh, when other patients might. Um, and uh, DVT prophylaxis is also more important uh, than non-obese patients. Um, you run into a lot of medical problems with these patients, and I'm going to tell you about this patient who uh, really surprised me. This is a patient coming in as an outpatient for elective bariatric surgery. She's 56 years old. Five foot three, 278 pounds, BMI is 49. She's got a history of chronic bronchitis. She gets the only symptoms of dyspnea on exertion, and she gets short of breath on lying flat like almost every bariatric surgery patient. Somebody got a stress test on her. It was normal, had normal LV and RV function. Uh, we got her pre-op chemistry. The chemistry, CO2 was 46. I actually didn't see this uh, before she went into the OR. The resident told me everything was okay, and I was covering two rooms, so I didn't look at the labs myself. Um, get into the room, and the resident calls me, Dr. Busco, come quick. Um, I can't get the SAT to work. Uh, so we, we tried three SAT monitors. We tried on her finger, nose, ears, clips everywhere. Uh, SAT doesn't go above 66, 68 percent. Do a blood gas. Nah, this one's venous. So I put an arterial line in, get that gas, 7.42, 32 PO2 on room air with a SAT of 63. Can cancel the case. Go talk to the family. Daughter says, yeah, she snores and she occasionally stops breathing. Um, Go into the case file, and 18 months earlier, she had been canceled by another, by another anesthesiologist, who, for, by, by another surgeon coming for bariatric surgery, and never went for her follow-up. Um, she, uh, at that point, had a uh, PCO2 of 56 and a SAT of 81%. So in the 18 months, she had gotten worse, also had gained 30 pounds. Um, we sent her for sleep studies, finally convinced her to go. She had apneas that were over two minutes in length. Her average desaturation was... Uh, I don't, this didn't really jive with our OR numbers because the SAT was 72%. Her lowest desaturation was to 48%. She did this fairly frequently. We took her to the OR, had her bypass. We left her intubated post-op, brought her to the ICU. The next day, I basically figured, thank God, she was an easy intubation. So I extubated her with, you know, not even doing a CPAP trial because I knew that I wouldn't be able to interpret it. Um, extubated her, put her on a BiPAP mask. She did well. A year later, I saw her when she came for follow-up. She had lost about 75 pounds. Put a pulse ox on her. Her SAT was up to 92%, and she felt great and looked great. But this is the type of patient you can end up with, uh, you know, and this is a patient who's walking around. Imagine what this patient would be like if she's critically ill. Uh, they get all these complications. They get chronic desaturation, chronic de hypercapnia. They may, if it's longstanding, get core pulmonary and ventricular failure, hypertension, arrhythmias, uh, et cetera. And the worst thing that you run into with these patients is when they get any kind of narcotics or any changes in mental status from any kind of sepsis, they, their respiratory system shuts down almost the, 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 the quickest you'll ever see. The other thing I'm going to talk about quickly is that, you know, these patients very frequently will have a history of asthma. And, you know, you see these patients and they'll tell you, oh, I have asthma. What do you use? I use an inhaler. Um, well, then you talk to them, how often do you use the inhaler? Oh, about two times a week, three times a week. And you listen to them, and they're, you know, they've got 
breath sounds coming out as you're talking to them. Uh, what do you do with these patients? These patients, most often, this is upper airway noises. They're not bronchospastic as evidenced by 50% of patients who have gastric bypass, who have a diagnosis of asthma, come off their medications after they've lost the weight. Um, these patients may have a bronchospastic disease that's, you know, a component that's part of the inflammatory uh, state of obesity, but, and they may have a history of inhaling use, but when you're taking care of these patients in the ICU, you have to realize they're not like the usual asthmatics that you take care of. They're not, you know, they, they don't have contraindications of beta blockers. They may not show a great improvement with any of the bronchodilators or any of the medications that we would usually use. So even though they may carry this scarlet letter, letter A on their forehead, when they come in, they may not be like the usual patient that we take care of. Um, what do we do differently when weaning these patients? Obviously, we have to accept lower levels of oxygenation. Uh, when they're extubated, they may take months to get better. Uh, and it's very important, the thing I try and impress on, on, on everybody when they take these patients to the OR, especially for emergency surgery, uh, is to get a room air blood gas on them, get some kind of uh, objective oxygenation level before they go in, because if you don't get it, you never know. And then you're sitting there in the ICU saying, well, what was their pre-op PO2? Was it 50? Was it 70? Was it 90? And it could be any of those three, and you really can't tell from looking at the patient. So getting something as, qu uh, as quickly as possible when the patient comes in is very helpful for managing them in the ICU. Um, if you have weaning protocols that are based on absolute numbers of CO2, of oxygenation, et cetera, you may have to throw them out the window because you can't, you know, how do you, how do you wean somebody whose PO2 before they got sick was 32? Um, it, it just doesn't work sometimes. Um, you can't use your normal criteria. Um, what you also want to do, these patients come in and, you know, the, when, the, when that lady came in and she had a PO2 of 62, a PCO2 of 62, the first thing I said was make sure you don't hyperventilate. I don't want to see them at 7.5640 tomorrow morning, okay? I want you to let, make sure the CO2 stays about the same. Ventilate by the pH. Don't ventilate by the PCO2. And this way when they, when they wake up and they do retain that CO2, they're not going to be too acidotic. Um, and it's uh, very similar to dealing with a, with a COPD or in that regard. Um, it, very frequently, almost more commonly than any other type of patient, you'll extubate these patients to non-invasive ventilation standby. It's not a failure if you have to get, uh, take the tube out and put them right on a BiPAP machine. It sometimes is the only way you're going to get them off a ventilator. Um, and obviously, any of the decisions to extubate these patients have to take into account how difficult the original intubation was. Uh, these patients obviously can be very difficult to intubate as, you know, I could go on for another 20 minutes talking about intubation of these patients, but the bottom line is, is when you're making the decision, if they were a very difficult intubation, you're probably going to, and they're very sick, and they're marginal, you're probably going to end up having to just do a trach on them because you can't take the chance after they've been intubated for a while. If they were a difficult intubation originally, they're going to probably be a very difficult intubation after that. And I want to thank you very much for uh, listening to the talk. We've got a minute or two. Uh, any questions or comments from the audience? <coughs> so, Lou, let me just ask you. I mean, you talked about non-invasive ventilation. I would agree 100% that in these patients, almost 100% of the time, it's a good idea to use non-invasive ventilation post-extubation. How long, in your experience, is it necessary to ventilate them non-invasively after you've extubated them? Uh, it depends whether or not they needed they needed non-invasive ventilation before. You know, I mean, that's the you know you get the patients who come in and they were on CPAP at home, or they needed CPAP but weren't getting it or weren't taking it. And these patients, you're going to probably need it the rest of their hospitalization and get them home until they've lost enough weight from their critical illness for their CPAP needs to go away. So they're going to need it at least part time. And if you get the patient who doesn't have any sleep apnea, I think that, that really determines it, how, how, whether they needed it. And so, you know, in, in New York, unfortunately, Medicaid patients can't get sleep studies. And so most of our patients who come in don't have sleep studies and don't have CPAP. Uh, and we just we have, end up having to put it on just a priori. Uh, but it, if we evaluate the patient and think they probably needed it, then we'll just send them to the floor with it and leave them on it and send them home with it. Thank you, Lou. Our next presentation is by Peter Morris, who is the director of the Medical ICU Wake Forest University Hospitals in uh, Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And Peter will be talking about early ambulation of mechanically ventilated patients. Good morning, everyone. 
hopefully warm weather, warmer weather today. I always think about the last day of these meetings as uh, being a special category that I think we should put in proposals to have either double CME credits or arrangement with our airlines to get double uh, frequent flyer miles. But this is an interesting topic, something near and dear to my heart, and I think um, I'll start with, uh, let's see if I can get this to work, my email address, just to say, why don't you, so you don't have to write during this presentation, put this into your Blackberries now, I'll be glad to send you these slides, they have a lot of references, we've tried to make this presentation kind of chock full with stuff so you can take it home and glance at it, but take a minute if you'd like to write this down now, and, uh, or we can get them through the SCCM, whichever is easier. But I think with this group here this morning, it would not be a hard argument to introduce this thought. That is, is it reasonable to consider of those patients who need mechanical ventilation for some prolonged need, not just a post-operative situation, is the consideration of moving these patients somewhat related with the thought that there'd be an improved outcome? And I think everybody would probably say yes. Now, in considering that statement, many questions come up, of course. And the series of slides I have to present to you today deal with the notion of these several questions I'll lay out for you. How early may a patient be engaged and not compromise safety? What exactly is the movement that you're going to do to these patients? Sit-ups, push-ups in ICU? What is it that you're going to do? And who should render the exercise portion of this? Which medical professional? How much procession? 400 push-ups, 300 sit-ups, and how often? Every day, every other day, seven days a week, five days a week? And certainly a consideration when we go to our hospital administrators to say this is an important piece of care. The care comes with the cost of human labor, so we're dealing with the notion of how is it justified not only across the hospitalization but long-term through the rehab time. I put this diagram into the talk, and I borrowed it and adapted it from a, a physiotherapist, a physiatrist, uh, Patrick Cordobin, to display the thought process behind what we're trying to accomplish with moving patients early in the ICU. On this axis, function. On this axis, time. Patient A and patient B get admitted to the ICU, and their function declines, premorbid conditioning, acute illness, and they recover and have a plateaued recovery. Now this patient starts at a lower point, and we think in here, particularly focus here, without a rehabilitation, they have possibly a slope of recovery like this. What is not known, really, is the early ICU rehab approaches. Can we actually alter that slope? No one really knows this. And in addition to that, can we achieve, is it worth doing this to achieve a higher plateau? or achieve a plateau at a more quick time. So the arguments come up, what's the timing of these rehab efforts? When do we start an aggressive, protocolized, team-based approach? These are things to be worked out consistently. And what are the doses and the consistencies of these therapies? So how many folks, by a show of hands, practice outside the United States here? So there is, in this topic particularly, there's a great deal of language differences in the concepts, and not only the concepts, but in the structure of how ICUs are run. Particularly physiotherapists, physical therapists, if people work outside the United States, there's a, a more lending of uh, physiotherapists who have more of a pulmonary point of view and even get involved more with ventilator issues, where in the United States, uh, the physical therapists, in their training, when you talk to the physical therapists, they don't train in the ICU. So it's a very different environment for them to be brought into. It's not a natural environment. It's not part of their training. So there's a great deal of differences across ICUs and even across the United States, how dense a physical therapy presence is. Many ICUs have no contact with physical therapy, and ours at Wake Forest was like that five or six years ago. Now, in addition to that sort of thing, we do have a culture of people who may think moving patients is really not safe, that you could risk hurting these patients further, and that, that culture hopefully will be able to be brought about as a change through data that says it is safe and there's meaning to it. So we do have to remember that it's li human labor we're talking here until we come up with devices to take over. And I'll just point out if people are bringing these arguments back to their administrators, 
that two manuscripts I came across address the variety and the variation of density of physiotherapy or physical therapy. Uh, this is a European experience, and this is that of Denver Mark Moss's group looking at the U.S. experience. By no means is this list exhaustive in this area. I look at several pieces of literature. I put these down, and to just point out the people who have written about this area of moving people on ventilators, and a great deal of them have worked with looking at the more prolonged uh, mechanically ventilated patient and moving them within the areas of a chronic ventilator unit and moving them back in their uh, therapies closer and closer to the time of intubation in the first, but there's a great wealth of information to these, the group in uh, Australia, Pennsylvania, Sue Burney and um, Linda Dennehy have worked in this area in Melbourne particularly, and this is a European report that's just come out recently, uh, all important. But I'll focus my comments on a group of literature that's come out in the last two or three years out of the University of Utah, Wake Forest, University of Chicago, and our colleagues at uh, in Leuven in Belgium who really are looking at how do we address this right from the beginning of the need for someone who has acute respiratory failure and how do we apply these strategies. To sum up these five manuscripts I would say that they are proposing that early movement of the mechanically ventilated patient deals with having a consistent team of multidisciplinary content with different medical professionals on the team and a protocol. So this team uses a protocol. Those are the two uh, themes that come through when you look at this literature. Uh, the types of people you'll mention, see mentioned in these teams are nursing assistants or physical therapy assistants, uh, particularly when looking at passive range of motion. A critical care bedside nurse experience is important, particularly people write about in their abilities to assess appropriateness and in their abilities to monitor safety. And then the terms physical therapist or, or, or physiotherapist, depending on where you work, and many groups have respiratory therapists on this team. And just a note about what does the protocol do? And I don't know if there's a actual magic involved in the protocol, but the protocol, like other protocols, tends to keep the priority of movement high. We all know, taking care of critically ill patients, there are competing needs and time attention issues whether we're putting in a vascular access device, trying to care for a vascular access device, the actual act of weaning the patient when we do our spontaneous breathing trials, running off for a CT scan, but the protocols tend to keep the ICU rehab thoughts alive in everybody's mind and we actually schedule time for it during the day so it gets done consistently. So in this session, I thought it was important at least to have one slide on what's, what do you do with the ventilator during these things? And, I think the first line here is the most important area for those who are interested in doing research here, that it's an area to optimize. And another way to translate that is there's not a lot of data to report to you about the specifics of what the mechanical ventilator is set at during the attempts when we move people in the ICU. Now of the manuscripts I mentioned just recently out of these groups, the University of Utah did actually describe it in their manuscript and they had a policy where before the activity and after the activity people would be on 30 minutes of assist control and during the activity the FiO2 would be nudged up by 0.2. In our experience at Wake Forest, uh, whether or not assist control or a pressure support mode, whatever the patient had been in, we tend to leave that person in. but. To give you an idea of the limitation of when these sessions end, very infrequently in our experience, in our report of 300 people or so with about 160 or so on the intervention arm, less than 1% of the sessions were actually stopped due to a decrease in, uh, in our uh, tolerance for their uh, O2 saturation. It was more due to patient fatigue and saying, I'm done, I can't do any more today. So uh, the anatomy of uh, a project, I'll get into a couple of these different reports, but at the Wake Experience ran and runs seven days a week. Uh, this team is comprised of two nursing assistants, a critical care nurse, and a physical therapist. And I'll show you the protocol. The protocol starts the first day people are in the ICU when they're intubated. Now these data across the board tend to describe medical patients. Uh, and we are dabbling with uh, addressing those particular themes that you must address with open abdomens and trauma patients because that brings in the whole different gamut of cervical spine and long bone fractures that you have to deal with as well. 
But in this particular protocol, this is the wake protocol, the, the protocols tend to be similar across the reported uh, manuscripts, but this one particularly address, addresses movement that is geared to the unconscious patient. So it's passive range of motion three times a day. Each joint is moved five times uh, through these different sessions. And then addressing the awake patient with the goal of getting them upright, using their trunk muscles, using their anti-gravity muscles, getting them to the edge of the bed, and hopefully even standing up and out of bed and sitting in a chair. And not necessarily waiting for the patient to be extubated before that is accomplished. In our protocol, we borrowed from our colleague Bernard de Jong about, okay, when do you know someone's awake? When you call the physical therapist, what is it? We tend to not use strength in an extremity uh, because of the issues of weakness in an ICU, but more of a, an alertness or a consciousness. And so in our protocol, when patients are able to uh, accomplish three of these five criteria, uh, then we call in our physical therapist and start the protocol from that point. But I will tell you, after working with this for a couple of years now, what our team tells you is even though there's someone maybe on the border and they kind of get it right and then they don't get it right, that delirium, not the active aggressive delirium, but the not quite with you all the time delirium. And how many of you have to take call and have to answer a phone? You'll notice the kind of phenomenon where when I get called at night and I'm lying down, I say, hold on a second, I have to get up before I really can think. And I don't know if it's a perfusion of the brain or a vestibular apparatus, but what our team tells us is even moving the patient more to an upright position, they seem to get more of an awareness to it. So even though we use this as our criteria, I, I would urge people to maybe push it a little bit. Uh, and I wish I could describe better the neurologic condition I just described very uh, crudely. Some pictures to show you of the passive range of motion techniques, both up upper and lower extremities are used. And when you look at these manuscripts, they tend to have some absolute criteria, the safety criteria, and these can be made up according to the absolutes that are within the culture of your ICU. We pick these without prospectively determining if this was the absolute safety. But when you look at these papers, you can come away with the notion that with these types of practices, the safety is present in the descriptions. To a degree, this types of therapy uh, I have not seen performed or not heard about being performed without the labor, without the human intensity of delivering this care. Physical therapist, a bedside nurse, and a uh, nursing assistant in this particular picture, each of the groups that I have spoken with tend to say, yeah, it's a, it's a group process and there's not something you can do with one person. When you have a lot of devices to deal with uh, and want to promote the safety, these are the ways that so far have been determined to accomplish the safety factor. But I'll just point out, prior to the work at Wake Forest in that, these particular units, this phenomenon was unheard of and never described. A, a person standing at the bedside who is still orally intubated, and several hospitals have accomplished this, and in unique situations across the world, people had been doing that. Uh, in our particular site, that was very unusual to have uh, performed, but this has become more and more commonplace. And in our quality improvement project, I'll just share some data. Uh, baseline criteria between 165 in a protocol group and in versus a control group were fairly similar. And I, I show this only to talk to other people about how to describe these things in the future when you have a therapy that pretty much is delivered to the people who tend to be survivors. You have to account for these people somehow. There was no difference here. And I only put it in here to describe that there wasn't an excess of death in the protocol group. So in the Wake Forest experience, having the protocol achieved of the people seeing uh, the physical therapist, and this is even if you saw them once uh, on the last day of your hospitalization with the protocol and the team, more sessions were accomplished. And over the course, of these populations, it was almost, or more than a doubling of the types of sessions. Now I'll point out something that's kind of a chuckle now, but at the time was, was a little frustrating for us because in the U.S., as I described, uh, physical therapists in the ICU are not extremely commonplace. And when we sent our manuscript in to review, it was reviewed by several people that we uh, assessed were probably not U.S., and they would write about physiotherapists. And I remember a couple of comments came back and describing this particular issue here. And it was kind of like, 
what do you mean you have no physiotherapist in your ICU? How can you run an ICU without physiotherapy or a physical therapist? And that's the phenomenon. And I don't know how many other people have that experience, but we had that experience of the goal of this was to accomplish the presence of a physical therapist in our ICU. Hard type of uh, physiologic determinations were not done on this uh, quality improvement project, but days to first out of bed when patients' feet would touch the floor was different between these two groups earlier in the control group. And depending on how you split these numbers, this is intention to treat accounting for those people who did die but never had received uh, physical therapy uh, in survivors and adjusted for baseline differences in survivors. There were numerically lower numbers for hospital length of stay in the protocol group. And you'll see these kinds of numbers reported in the other types of manuscripts with these types of themes. Safety data across the board uh, looked acceptable for this type of therapy from not just the WAKE experience, but from the Utah experience, the Chicago experience, and the Leuven experience. I'd just like to point out some other manuscripts in this field that have lent other layers to this argument to promote the early movement on mechanical ventilation. The group in Chicago measured outcomes not only in hard types of ICU parameters, vent days, ICU days, hospital length of stay, but activities of daily living and with the protocol showed that the people who got therapy had achieved a higher degree of uh, daily living scores than uh, those who did not receive it. And they were able to blend their uh, sedation protocol with this activity protocol and, and showed less delirium days and had very favorable numbers in a number of parameters. Some with these numbers of patients hit statistical significance, but very favorable overall. And the group in Leuven, Rick Gosling's group, has, you know, it's very, I would just point out how you interpret these things because I'll just say one thing, in the Wake Forest report, the control group is virtually no presence in the ICU of physical therapy versus having something. And in reports like the group in Leuven, they have a very aggressive approach to their physiotherapy. And what they did in this particular study is added to that uh, a cycle exercise in bed. And they took a group of patients who were about five days into their mechanical ventilation who they thought were deemed to go on for a several more days in the ICU on a ventilator. And they had about 90 patients randomized to this type of therapy or not. And they were able to show at hospital discharge that their six-minute walk tests were better and quality of life scores with the SF36 were improvement. So another layer, outcome, patient-centered outcomes uh, to show that this may be uh, a favorable thing to do for our patients. I'll just share with you one new study that is ongoing now at Wake Forest that is supported by the NIH that's addressing three components of an intervention, a passive range of motion that starts from day one for acute respiratory failure therapy, a physical therapy approach that looks at anti-gravity muscle improvement, trunk muscle, standing up, walking, but also adding that third type of approach where your upper and lower extremities are put through passive resistant exercise. If people work with physical therapy in the United States, you'll see they like these TheraBands or elastic bands that they use. That's what we're using. They're graded in terms of the difficulty with different colors. And so that's on the protocol that will take about four years to complete uh, the usual care versus an intervention, but runs across the hospitalization. And to add in to our prior experience, strength and functional testing and an outcome component to this. Now, one of the things in looking at these types of reports is trying to get at the blinded factor. It's very hard to blind these kinds of uh, investigations. So one step we did take uh, was that the team delivering the therapy is not blinded, but the people assessing the strength, their exercise physiologists, they're blinded to which group people in. And we've actually gone through dialogue to coach the patients, the subjects, not to say, I just love that physical therapist who comes in every day so they don't break the blind. Uh, and the end point will be length of stay censored for death. I'll leave you with a notion of, yes, there's some information out there, but a lot more is needed to make this clear. This field is not clear yet. It's moving in that direction. Um, and I would think that the areas to push on, particularly if people are interested, is work that helps all of us take care of our patients in a way that we can better assess their pains during this session. People hurt in the ICU. They've got every parts of their body has a piece of plastic in it, and how we deal particularly, because we know anxiety and breathlessness is different in different people, how to assess this carefully and address it 
uh, with an individual approach. It's unclear which medical professionals are uh, absolutely required. Several people in the field, like myself, are biased that the magic that the physical therapist and the physiotherapist can provide their training, their thought process, is different from what I went through and I think lend a certain degree of professionalism that is not available with other people, but that's a very expensive type of approach. Also work with phenotypes in the ICU is are there different therapies depending either on the baseline dysfunction or the degree of ICU or the illness itself, COPD is versus heart failure versus pneumonia and ARDS, how do we address those specific rehab needs and should they be protocolized on a disease-specific uh, type of manner. And like any other change in the ICU, how we bring about bringing this change is always a challenge for people involved in improvements. So in summary, I would leave you with this literature that has established a degree of safety with a team and a protocol approach. Certainly the international definitions will be tightened, I suspect, and will help in the conversations to have in the future and the how-to type of descriptions hopefully will also be elaborated with future manuscripts. Outcome data, making this relevant where if you do this to patients, have you affected something other than getting them out of the hospital more quickly? Is it meaningful for the patient? Are they better more quickly? And if anyone has an idea to make it more simple, please share. This is something we need across the board. Thank you for your attention, and if there's time, I'll, I'll try to address any comments. If I might ask one question, I mean, we have ambulated, tracheostomized, mechanically ventilated patients for a long time, and the concern as we try to move towards the intubated patient is the probability of loss of that airway as we move the patient out of bed even into the chair. I did not see in your data uh, an indication of potential loss of airway or airway problems, et cetera, as you move these patients. Can you comment about your experience in that area? Of the intervention arm that we had, just to give you a percentage of how often that can be achieved, more often than not, people went through the transition of their uh, unconsciousness into consciousness and rapidly moving either to a trach or to be extubated. But a fifth of the people, about 20% of the people on the intervention arm were able to be stood. They were able to achieve uprightness with an endotracheal tube, without any loss of endotracheal tube. And that's consistent across the experience with the University of Utah, with the people at University of Chicago. So I think the approach to that is certainly someone who is actively coughing, uh, people who are because of either pain or anxiety or an, uh, an aggressive delirium cannot interact uh, with the team. Uh, those people we are not able to move easily, but the calm and collected person who isn't aggravated uh, aggressively or acutely by a small degree of movement of their endotracheal tube, because it is virtually impossible when you move these people in the different positions not to tug on something. You saw those pictures. That tube will move in their throat, and depending on any one individual's gag reflex, but it tends to be after time a certain numbing of that area of the posterior pharynx. These patients, uh, I was amazed to see it myself, but after seeing it for a couple of years now, the, the amount of people that can actually tolerate this therapy is uh, higher than I would have thought going into it. Uh, one question. When you ambulate them, uh, do you use a specialized walker that you could put everything on, or is it something you cobbled together yourself? Uh, there's different approaches in different centers. Um, I, I would answer it by you can do all of those, and people have done all of those and reported it. In our group, our density of respiratory therapy doesn't lend itself easily to coordinate that, so we're pretty much limited by the length of our ventilator hosing, and we just kind of march people in place. University of Utah, uh, in hearing how they are able to perform, are very comfortable with bagging patients as they walk. Our colleagues at Johns Hopkins have a nice cart that they put together and keep their ventilator on the cart and can move around with it. So there's a number of different strategies and I, I tend to think it has to do with the culture and what resources you may have and the expertise locally of what becomes comfortable. Each group will determine its safety level, but I think all those approaches have been discussed and are achievable. 
We'll have to move on to the uh, last presentation in this series. That will be given by Bruce Friedman, who is the Critical Care Director at Joseph M. Stillborn Center in Augusta, Georgia. And Bruce will be talking about mechanical ventilation of patients with burns. Thank you very much. Thanks for uh, allowing me to talk about this uh, uh, very uh, interesting and clearly specialty topic. Um, we're at the Joseph M. Still Burn Center in Augusta, Georgia. It is the largest burn center in the country and also the busiest burn center in the country. So we see well over 2,000 burns a year. Uh, and if people in the audience know anything about burns, most uh, burn units see about 200. So uh, we are uh, getting people from all over the southeast, uh, pretty sick folks, uh, very large burns, uh, and a lot of experience with mechanical ventilation. Uh, the injury that's most common is above the glottis. Uh, it's heat. Uh, it's a heat-related usually or some exposure, tox exposure. In, in the south, it's gas on trash or GOT. Uh, they burn a lot of trash in the south. We've had people trapped in the middle of a fire after they burn trash around them and they can't get out. You know, we get all, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, it, it can lead to a perceived need for intubation, uh, and that is actually a significant problem. Uh, it's seen both in our population, and uh, there's been several studies in the trauma literature uh, in terms of uh, uh, pre-morbid uh, or pre-transfer uh, intubation uh, that becomes a significant issue whether or not the patients really need to be intubated. Now, if they truly have an injury below the glottis, and I've heard all kinds of stories. I've had the guy with the carburetor, he was working on his carburetor, and he sucked the fire into his mouth, and uh, that's why we intubated him. Well, you know, the, these things don't happen. I had one lady that just the other day, they said they swore that her tongue was burnt up and her airway was charcoal. Of course, we did a laryngoscope and we bronked her, and there was no charcoal, there was no... Uh, there is a real misunderstanding of who should be intubated, who shouldn't be intubated, but clearly when they do need to be intubated, uh, it does reduce mortality, uh, and, uh, and they may need to stay intubated because uh, of, the, of the potential for severe consequences post a true inhalation exposure. However, about 85% of the people that come to our unit uh, are in, not intubated ap appropriately. Uh, and they are not following the, the normal guidelines, which are burned in an enclosed space, truly burned in an enclosed space, and there for a reasonable amount of time that it would be a problem. We get people where you read the report from the referral center, and they say, that patient was awake and alert uh, when, when we got there at the, uh, at the facility, and we brought them to the ER, but we intubated them anyway. It, it, you know, uh, whether it was for pain control, whether it was for this, whether it was for that, or a perceived need that they need to be intubated. And, of course, uh, it is not without a consequence to shove a tube down somebody. We've had uh, patients, uh, unfortunately, where uh, tracheal, uh, tracheal tissue has been torn. Uh, we've had several patients that they've had tried multiple intubations. For example, I had a patient with a burn to their nose uh, that they tried multiple intubations on and actually ended up criking the guy. Uh, and he clearly did not need to be intubated. So you really have to evaluate these patients um, because of the potential damage uh, that can be done to the airway. And unfortunately, with the way, and this is just kind of an a, 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 a editorial comment, with the way things are going in healthcare, people are getting intubated to upcharge uh, the... the uh, uh, the the uh, initial evaluation, and that's something you have to be. We need to be looking at, and research really needs to be focused on this early intubation issue. Get a patient like this, you probably want to consider intubation. There's a significant amount of airway involvement here. This is a patient that uh, clearly. Now, but you get a patient like this who has a contact burn from uh, asphalt. Uh, he's fine, he's awake and alert, he just has some tar on his face. Well, some people would throw an into, endotracheal tube in this patient, but he would, would not need it. And in fact, he did fine with just cleaning off the tar and uh, some localized uh, uh, wound care. 
Uh, this patient clearly needs intubation. Swelling, significant, you can see the whiteness around the, uh, some of the areas of the face. Uh, there's maybe some third degree burn here. Uh, uh, this is clearly somebody who you want to protect their airway. Uh, clearly, somebody like this needs to be on mechanical ventilation. Uh, you've got a, probably about an 80, 75 to 80 percent full thickness burn here that requires escherotomy. It's going to be in the burn unit for probably three months. Uh, they're going to be need. They're going to usually need to be intubated. So, how do we get from the 28-year-old lineman uh, with a 40,000 volt injury, a significant injury, uh, and he gets extubated? Uh, and does well, For unfortunately loses his arms, but he survives. Or you get this devastating injury where the patient loses leg, arm, uh, and ultimately loses both legs and, uh, and most of his abdomen, uh, and he's up and about and actually has become an artist. Uh, so these patients do need to be on mechanical ventilation, uh, uh, but they, they, uh, they do actually end up surviving these devastating injuries. In, uh, uh, injuries. Low tidal volume ventilation, um, again, in, in the ARDS network, as you all know, has very solid data. However, it is quite controversial in these special situations, uh, and that's burns, major trauma, uh, and other very high hyperdynamic states. There's really very little data to support uh, the very low tidal volume concept. And in fact, as I travel all over globally, uh, the, the, one of the bigger questions that other burn doctors or burn intensive care people ask me is, are you using low tidal volume? And, and of course, and, I, and I'll say what, I'll show you what I do, but basically there is some significant issues with uh, doing it, especially in our population. I'll bring you just one little, again, I'm, I'm a, a little bit of a heretic I like to do. I like to present things that I, I kind of, because I've been doing this for a long time, but uh, we, we were involved in a study with the Sevillistat, which is an elastase uh, inhibitor in the lung, and the Japanese actually have some very, very good data on it. Well, one of the problems with the Sevillistat study, and that's the reference, was it failed. But it failed, I truly believe, because the emphasis on the study was not looking at the drug effect, but was trying to maintain a very low tidal volume protocol, and that interfered significantly with the data. And it's unfortunate because I think the drug can, could be helpful for inhalation and severe lung injury. But because of the design of the protocol, trying to match subpopulations that may or may not have worked in a low tidal volume setting, uh, the, the, uh, the data may very well have been, uh, been uh, 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 dismissed because of that. Uh, again, low tidal volume ventilation does not does carry with it significant problems, and especially in our patient population, the uncorrectable acidosis uh, is a significant problem. Uh, I just cannot provide that ventilation uh, in a hyperdynamic burn, large burn, without pHs dropping into the, uh, into the low uh, mid-sixes. Uh, it's, 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 it's nearly impossible to do that, uh, and uh, therefore uh, it does not necessarily work in, in the hyperdynamic population. This is a study in burns looking at high peep, low volume ventilation in 61 patients. Uh, and there indeed was no statistical significant difference between the groups uh, where they tried to reach uh, doing a low tidal volume with the emphasis of peep, which is what uh, a lot of the low tidal volume studies have shown uh, you can override. Uh, again, I think that in this population that becomes a problem. Uh, what uh, has been used in the past and has been suggested uh, most recently, and this is a, a concept that goes back prior to the low tidal volume concept, uh, is using a volumetric diffusive respirator, which is what we call a high frequency percussive ventilator. This is the ventilator here on the picture. It's pneumatically powered. Uh, the amount of uh, ventilator stacking through the oscillatory mechanism varies on the reports, usually between 4 and 10 hertz. You select a pulmonary artery pressure, uh, you use a sliding Venturi uh, system, which I'll show you, the phasotron, and an in inspiration, uh, you use a, a passive ending at a selected level of a uh, oscillatory CPAP. Uh, this is uh, HP, HFPV, or the uh, uh, VDR ventilator pattern. You can see how it's different from high-frequency oscillating ventilation. It's not truly a high-frequency, it's not a high-frequency 
concept. It's a totally different concept from high frequency. This is the phasotron. Uh, again, nice little cartoon. I like it. Kind of. It's still it, it, to me. It looks like two machine guns there. But um, the uh, it's the it's a sliding venturi body, and that's how it uh, delivers the percussion. And it really is a true low tidal volume system, uh, but in a totally different pattern than normal uh, mechanical ventilation. Um, the clinical characteristics when you use this, it improves gas exchange. It utilizes a rescue mode for uh, pa especially patients with refractory ARDS. It does improve clearance of secretions. It's uh, quite remarkable with that, that uh, based on a number of the uh, data that has been presented. However, the data is very limited. There's not a lot of data uh, in the use of the VDR, even in the burn population. Uh, this was a prospective randomized trial. Uh, using the VDR, uh, this was primarily in children out of the Cincinnati burn unit, uh, um, the Shriners burn unit. They had 64 patients prospectively uh, looked at. Uh, the patients did uh, re uh, uh, require significantly lower peak inspiratory pressures. They had higher PAFO I of 2 ratios. But there was really, uh, 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 there was no significant differences between the group other than the uh, Barrow trauma was a little bit more limited in the uh, uh, pressure control ventilation group. But it does appear clinically that the VDR can be quite helpful, uh, especially in children. This is a comparison at the, now this is a little different, this is high frequency oscillatory ventilation with, uh, with uh, smoke inhalation injury. Again, here we had uh, patients that were burned with inhalation injury uh, and we had patients with just burns only. The patients that had ARDS and no inhalation injury actually improved on high-frequency ventilation. Uh, however, the patients with ARDS and inhalation injury, of course, with a burn, did not improve and actually often failed high-frequency uh, ventilation. So there is significant controversy using high-frequency oscillatory ventilation in, in the burn population as it is in the general population. And it's also very difficult to deliver nebulized therapy. Uh, and again, if you know about inhalation injury, there are a lot of people that use various forms of nebulized therapy, including heparin and acetylcysteine, et cetera. The most recent study, and this was actually presented here by my friend Kevin Chong from uh, Brook Army Medical Center, they did the burn center evaluation of standard therapy, uh, looking uh, primarily at uh, conventional ventilation uh, versus high-frequency percussive ventilation using the VDR. Uh, and they did find here that in, it was uh, statistically significant in rescue-free days. It was not significant, however, in reducing ventilator-free days uh, or days uh, free of uh, multi-organ dysfunction. Uh, you wouldn't expect it to uh, show any mortality differences. Uh, but there was a difference, a uh, significant difference in barrow trauma. There was more barrow trauma seen in the conventional ventilation uh, population uh, than in the uh, VDR population. And as with the previous study with children, uh, in this population of adults, uh, there was a significant uh, re uh, re reduction in the PAFIO2 ratio. Uh, these were the rescue patterns. It's quite interesting. They, there was only, they had uh, significant ventilator-associated tracheo, ne necrotizing tracheobronchitis in two patients. Uh, and uh, on uh, high-frequency uh, ventilation for the first day, this is what they saw. After that first day of rescue, uh, there was significant improvement uh, with the ability to clear secretions. Uh, in their study, again, ventilator-free days uh, uh, were, uh, were not different, but the PF ratios improved. And indeed, the protective strategy of the VDR actually gave better oxygenation, goal, reached the goals better. But overall, not a big punch, uh, uh, although I think the VDR is a, is a consideration in our population in lieu of the, other, of the normal type of low tidal volume that's used in other units. Um, Something that I also use a lot of, and I think that now uh, with this paper just coming out this year, uh, we've been doing this for, uh, God, 10, 12, 13, 15, whatever years, 
aggressive bronchoscopic therapy in these patients with significant uh, uh, lung injury, uh, whether it be direct inhalation injury, sloughing, whatever. Uh, and indeed, uh, this, uh, this study uh, actually verified some of that data in large burns, actually showed du du uh, decreased duration of mechanical ventilation, shorter hospital stay, and uh, with an aggressive use of uh, bronchoscopy uh, uh, being justified. And we do do a very aggressive use of bronchoscopy in this patient population to help them get off mechanical ventilation. And again, you can see the kinds, of, I could show you hundreds of thousands of pictures of bronchoscopies, all kinds of things that we see. Uh, in, 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 here's the typical carbonaceous, very thick, very difficult to get off the airway, uh, very difficult to deal with. Uh, the unknown uh, is what we do. I mean, again, we, we, what we do is, is a little different. Okay, don't, you can't locate. Okay. Move on. <laughs> I don't know why you can't look. What does that mean? There you go. What do we do? Uh, conventional ventilation is primarily what we still do. Uh, we don't uh, use the VDR in our unit yet uh, because our unit is primarily adults uh, and that I take care of. We have pediatrics. Uh, we use conventional uh, ventilation with uh, controlled mechanical ventilation, with IMV, with PEEP, with mid-range tidal volumes, your standard T-collar weaning, and we do very well uh, with our mechanical ve ventilatory protocols. Uh, we do do serial bronchoscopies. We emphasize a very, the lowest possible FiO2, uh, and I, that's not new. That's the old, older than the wind. Uh, John Downs has been saying that for years, and more recently Warren Garner uh, from California, one of the burn directors at UCLA, uh, has been uh, uh, postulizing this as well. Uh, we're very early in our percutaneous tracheostomies. Again, I think the controlling the airway, these patients are in the unit for long periods of time. Uh, it's justifiable to do that. Uh, uh, the presentation on rehab was excellent, and we do that. We are very, very aggressive early. Uh, it's key. Uh, at the bottom line is we exercise and we need to eat, and that's how we survive. That's a basic principle of survival, and that's what you do. The be the, you're healthier. Your immune system is better if you eat well and you exercise. Well, that's the same thing you've got to do with these patients. You've got to make them eat well and you exercise, and we're very aggressive with both that and our nutrition, as you can see, we use micro macronutrients. We primarily use crucial or oxepa, uh, and we use anabolics as well uh, to help these patients off mechanical ventilation. We also use ketoconazole prophylactically, as again the ARDS network failed to recognize the fact that ketoconazole was a prophylactic drug, not a therapeutic drug. The three studies that suggested that it works were all prophylactic, they were not treatment. They tried to do a study uh, to treat ARDS uh, uh, with ketoconazole. Well, you can't because the data clearly showed in the three prior studies that the only thing that ketoconazole will do will reduce inflammatory markers in the lung. It will not change the outcome if you already have ARDS. So we do it very early. We recognize somebody who we think is going to be a significant problem from an inhalation standpoint, and we start ketoconazole almost immediately at 400 milligrams Q day. The other thing we've played around with, and I'll, I'll rush through this, is zygris. We've used zygris uh, uh, as a single organ in ARDS and severe inhalation injury. This is one patient of a series that we looked at and presented several years ago uh, with significant uh, severe uh, acute lung injury, treated with Zygris uh, by standard protocol. In fact, this, is what, this was the lung that I showed you earlier. This was his lung. He was in a hotel fire. Uh, he was uh, in, with appropriate uh, uh, Zygris protocol, uh, of a 96-hour protocol. This is what he was extubated well before you would expect him to be extubated and his lungs cleared significantly. And it makes sense because it is a significant respiratory uh, uh, drug. Uh, and in fact, some people are actually using it as inhalation, uh, uh, direct inhalation exposure. The other thing, uh, this was a chemical exposure, chlorine accident that we had in Graniteville several years ago. This was one of the patients. We treated that with Zygris uh, and again uh, got remarkable results uh, on the respiratory side. Finally, just to leave you for food for thought, 
uh, and I always like to do that because the future is, is in our, is, is in our, our thought process and our, and our innovation. Uh, Bob Burrell, who I know, is the, he is the Einstein of silver. Uh, he invented Acticote. Uh, there are people in your lifetime that you meet that are remarkably brilliant, and you can understand everything they say, and that's Bob Burrell. Well, we've been looking at silver as a, you know, again, we're all having trouble with ventilator-associated pneumonia and trying to limit it. Uh, well, silver is very interesting because silver works on the skin as an anti-inflammatory as well as it's bactericidal, my, mycobactericidal, virucidal, fungicidal. Well, if you take a lung, and this is an animal model, uh, and, you, uh, and you expose it to a severe infection, in this case, pseudomonas, uh, you can see here the normal lung here uh, and the infected lung 48 hours on both sides. This is the infected lung um, treated with uh, uh, tobramycin. This is the infected lung uh, treated with silver, aerosolized. Uh, silver not only uh, restores the natural architecture, as you can see, because of it's an anti-inflammatory effect, uh, as well as getting rid of the infection, uh, it is a significant uh, area that we need to be looking at, uh, possibly for prophylaxis as well as treatment of our patients, and again, a way in which we can get them off mechanical ventilation. So food for thought, interesting data. Uh, and thank you. Uh, we're going to have to end the session. We're running a little over. I'm sure that Bruce will be available to answer anybody's questions individually. Thank, I'd like to thank all the speakers and everybody for attending. Have a good day.